Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I have been using Tinder for a few months, mostly out of boredom and curiosity. Swiping left and right had become a mindless habit, and I didn't really expect to find anything meaningful. That is, until I stumbled upon Davina's profile. Her pictures were stunning, long, dark hair cascading down her back, emerald green eyes that seemed to sparkle even through the screen, and a smile that could stop traffic. I was instantly drawn to her. Without hesitation, I swiped right, my heart skipping a beat when it's a match. A message popped up. We began chatting immediately, and I was pleasantly surprised by how easy our conversation flowed. She was witty, intelligent, and seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me. We bonded over our shared love of travel, our favorite books, and our dreams for the future. Before I knew it, hours had passed, and I found myself eagerly awaiting her next message. After a few days of constant texting, we decided it was time to meet in person. We agreed on a cozy little coffee shop downtown, a neutral spot for a first date. As the day approached, I found myself getting more and more excited. I couldn't wait to see if our connection was as strong in person as it was online. When the day finally arrived, I took extra care getting ready. I picked out my best outfit, spent a little more time on my hair, and even splashed on some cologne. I wanted to make a good first impression. With a final check in the mirror, I headed out the door, my stomach filled with a mix of nerves and anticipation. I arrived at the coffee shop a few minutes early and grabbed a table by the window. I kept glancing at the door, my heart jumping every time it opened. And then finally she walked in. As she drew closer, my heart sank further with each step. The woman approaching me bore little resemblance to Davina I had been so enamored with online. Her hair, which in photos had been a lustrous raven black that seemed to shimmer under the light, was instead a dulled, mousy brown that hung limply around her face. The vibrant, emerald eyes that had captivated me from behind the screen were replaced by a mundane, unremarkable shade that seemed to lack any depth or sparkle. But it was her smile that struck me the most. In her profile pictures, her grin had been dazzling, lighting up her entire face and radiating a warmth and joy that had drawn me in like a moth to a flame. But the smile she wore now as she walked towards me seemed forced, almost painful, as if she were going through the motions of a well-rehearsed act. As she sat down across from me, I tried my best to mask my disappointment. I reasoned with myself that perhaps she simply wasn't photogenic, that the camera hadn't captured her true essence. Maybe I thought optimistically her personality would be so engaging, so captivating, that it would overshadow any physical discrepancies. But as we began to talk, my hopes were quickly dashed. The witty, lively banter that had flowed so naturally in our text conversations was notably absent. Instead of the engaging, insightful comments I had grown accustomed to, her responses were dull and generic, lacking any depth or substance. She seemed more interested in talking about herself than in getting to know me, frequently steering the conversation back to her own experiences and opinions. As the minutes ticked by, I found myself struggling to maintain interest. We seemed to have little in common, and any attempts I made to find shared ground were met with disinterest or indifference. The sparkle and chemistry that had been so evident in our online interactions were glaringly missing in person. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt, thinking perhaps she was just nervous or having an off day. But as the coffee in our cups grew cold and the conversation continued to stagnate, I couldn't shake the growing realization that the person sitting across from me was a far cry from the Davina I thought I had known. The disappointment was palpable, a heavy weight settling in my chest. I had allowed myself to get caught up in the excitement of a potential connection, had let my imagination run wild with the possibilities of what could be, but faced with the harsh reality of the situation, I couldn't deny the truth any longer. As I sat there, nodding politely at her self-centered anecdotes, I found my mind wandering, questioning how I could have been so easily misled. The red flags seemed glaringly obvious in retrospect. The two perfect photos, the almost immediate connection, the way she always seemed to say exactly what I wanted to hear. I felt foolish due to as if I had fallen for a cheap magic trick. But more than that, I felt a keen sense of disappointment, a mourning for the connection I thought I had found. 
It was a harsh reminder that the digital world could be a smoke and mirrors, that the personas we craft online don't always align with the truth of who we are. As the date dragged on, I found myself itching to leave, to put this misadventure behind me and chalk it up to a lesson learned. I made an excuse about an early morning commitment, feigning an apologetic smile as I gathered my things to go. But even as I walked away from the cafe, my mind was reeling. How could I have been so easily deceived? And more importantly, what did this say about the nature of connection in the modern age? Was it possible to truly know someone through a screen, or were we all just chasing digital phantoms, projections of our own desires and fantasies? I started by reverse searching her profile images. To my shock, they belonged to a model in Ukraine. Davina, or whoever she really was, had been catfishing me the entire time. But it didn't end there. Further dating revealed that the phone number she had been texting me from was registered to a man named David. A sinking feeling settled in my stomach as I realized the extent of the deception. David had been posing as Davina, using fake pictures in a fabricated persona to lure unsuspecting men like myself in. I reported the profile to Tinder and blocked the number, feeling violated and foolish. How could I have been so easily duped? I prided myself on being cautious and perceptive, yet I had fallen for a scam that, in hindsight, seemed glaringly obvious. Because despite the deception, the connection I had felt with Davina had been genuine. I had opened up to her in a way I rarely did with others. And while the outcome had been far from ideal, it had shown me that I was capable of forming deep, meaningful bonds, even in the digital age. I was swiping through Tinder, as I often did in my free time, when I matched with him. Let's call him Jake. He was cute, with a friendly smile and a profile that suggested we had similar interests. We struck up a conversation, and it flowed easily. He was funny, engaging, and seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me. After a few days of messaging, we decided to meet up for a casual date. We grabbed coffee at a local cafe and chatted for hours. It was comfortable, like catching up with an old friend. We had a lot in common and the conversation never felt forced. I left feeling optimistic about where this could go. Our next few dates were pleasant enough. We went to a quaint Italian restaurant where the candlelit ambience and soft music set a romantic tone. Jake pulled out my chair, complimented my outfit, and listened attentively as I talked about my week. He shared funny anecdotes from his job, and we discovered a mutual love for classic rock. The conversation flowed easily, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. The following weekend, we decided to catch a movie. As we shared a tub of popcorn, our hands brushed occasionally, but I didn't feel the electric spark I was hoping for. Jake put his arm around me, and while it was a sweet gesture, it felt more comforting than thrilling. I found my mind wandering during the film, questioning why I wasn't feeling more excited about this seemingly perfect guy beside me. In an effort to ignite some passion, I suggested a hike for our next date. I thought maybe the beauty of nature and the rush of endorphins would stir up some butterflies. And while the scenery was breathtaking and the exercise invigorating, my feelings for Jake remained platonic. He was attentive, making sure I had water and snacks, offering a hand on the steeper inclines. He was a true gentleman, but my heart just wasn't skip a beat. As we went on more dates, I started to feel increasingly guilty. Here was this amazing man, kind, considerate, and clearly interested in me, and I just couldn't reciprocate his level of enthusiasm. I appreciated his company, but I knew I wasn't being fair to him or myself by continuing this charade. I realized I needed to be honest with Jake as much as I dreaded the conversation. I didn't want to hurt him, but I knew leading him on would be far worse in the long run. So with a heavy heart, I asked him to meet me for a walk in the park. As we strolled along the tree-lined path, I tried to gather my thoughts. I took a deep breath and turned to face him, my hands fidgeting nervously. I explained that while I truly enjoyed our time together, I just wasn't feeling the romantic connection I was hoping for. I emphasized that it wasn't anything he did or didn't do. He was wonderful in every way. I just couldn't force feelings that weren't there. To his credit, Jake took the news remarkably well, at least initially. He listened quietly, nodding his understanding. He thanked me for my honesty and said he respected my feelings. He admitted he was disappointed, but that he valued our friendship and hoped we could remain in each other's lives in some capacity. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The hardest part was over, and it seemed we were on the same page. We hugged, 
and I truly believe this was the start of a mature platonic friendship. If only I knew then how wrong I was. If only I could have foreseen the dark turn our story was about to take. But as we parted ways that day, smiling sadly but amicably, I had no idea that this was just the calm before the storm. I couldn't have predicted the lengths you would go to, the fear he would instill in me, the way he would uproot my life so thoroughly. A few days later, the messages started. At first, they were innocuous enough. A, hey, how are you? Here, a thinking of you there. I responded politely, but briefly trying to maintain a friendly distance. But his messages became more frequent, more insistent. He'd ask where I was, what I was doing, who I was with. It started to feel less like friendly curiosity and more like an interrogation. Then I started seeing him everywhere. Outside my work at my regular coffee spot in the grocery store parking lot. At first, I tried to convince myself it was just a coincidence. We didn't live in the same area, after all. But the frequency of these run-ins started to feel deliberate, unsettling. His messages took on a more aggressive tone. He'd accuse me of leading him on, of being selfish and cold-hearted. He'd oscillate between anger and desperation, threatening one moment and pleading the next. I started to feel genuine fear, a cold dread in the pit of my stomach every time my phone buzzed. I tried to block his number, but he'd always find another way to contact me, email, social media, even showing up at my doorstep once. I felt trapped, stalked, unable to escape his constant presence in my life. I became paranoid, jumpy. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, my heart racing at every unexpected sound. I stopped going out, stopped seeing friends, stopped living my life. I was a prisoner of my own fear. I finally reached out to the police when he started making explicit threats. They took a report, but admitted there was little they could do unless he actually tried to harm me. I felt helpless alone like no one could protect me from this invisible menace. It's been a year now since the last message, the last sighting. I've moved to a new city, changed my number, my locks. Slowly, piece by piece, I've started to rebuild the life he shattered, but the scars remain. The fear, the mistrust, the constant nagging feeling that I'm being watched. I'm more guarded now, slower to trust. I don't use dating apps anymore. The thought of opening myself up to another stranger, of making myself vulnerable again, fills me with icy dread. I'm working on it in therapy, trying to separate one bad experience from my entire perception of relationships and intimacy. It's a slow, painful process. I never thought I'd be the type to fall for a Tinder scam. I always saw myself as cautious, street smart, not easily fooled. But I guess there's a first time for everything. And Mia, well, she was something else entirely. Her profile drew me in right away. Striking looks, an adventurous spirit, and a bio that hinted at a life fully lived. When we match, I felt a jolt of excitement. Little did I know that excitement would soon turn to dread. Our first date was like something out of a movie. Mia had suggested this new, upscale bar that had just opened up downtown. It was the kind of place I wouldn't normally go to on my own. All sleek lines, moody lighting, and an extensive list of artisanal cocktails with names I could barely pronounce. But Mia seemed excited about it, and her enthusiasm was infectious. From the moment we walked in, the atmosphere felt electric. The soft buzz of conversation, the clink of glasses, the low thrum of music. It all blended together into a heady ambiance that seemed to promise something exciting, something magical. We snagged a cozy booth in the corner, and as soon as we sat down, the conversation started flowing with the cocktails. It turned out Mia and I had a shared passion for travel, and we quickly fell into swapping stories of our adventures. She told me about the time she got lost in the winding streets of Marrakech, only to stumble upon a hidden rooftop restaurant with the most incredible view of the sunset. I countered with my misadventures navigating the chaotic night markets of Bangkok, and how I ended up sharing a makeshift meal with a family of locals who spoke no English but communicated through laughter and gestures. As we talked, I found myself more and more drawn to Mia. She had this way of making you feel like you were the only person in the room, like everything you said was fascinating and important. Her eyes sparkled in the candlelight as she leaned in close to listen, her hand occasionally brushing mine as she punctuated a point or reached for her drink. And oh, the drinks. They were like nothing I'd ever tasted. Complex, surprising, each one a little work of art. 
We sampled each other's choices, trying to guess the secret ingredients, laughing at our failed attempts. With each sip, each shared moment of discovery, the connection between us seemed to grow stronger, more magnetic. As the night wore on, the bar grew more crowded, the energy more frenetic, but in our little corner booth, it felt like we were in our own private world. Every casual touch, every lingering glance felt loaded with potential. The air between us practically crackled with tension, with unspoken possibility. When Mia invited me back to her place, it felt like the most natural thing in the world. Like the whole evening had been building up to this moment. I didn't even hesitate, didn't stop to question if it was too soon, too reckless. I was caught up in the magic of it all, in the promise of where this incredible connection might lead. The ride to her apartment was a blur of stolen kisses and whispered anticipation. When we finally stumbled through her door, giggling like teenagers, it felt like anything was possible. Mia disappeared into the kitchen, promising to mix us one last nightcap. I remember settling onto her couch, feeling giddy and lightheaded, marveling at the turn the night had taken. When she pressed the glass into my hand, I took a deep sip without a second thought, eager to prolong this perfect buzz, this perfect moment. But as soon as the liquid hit my tongue, I knew something was off. There was a bitter chemical taste that seemed to coat my mouth, burning the back of my throat. I frowned, glancing down at the murky contents of the glass. I tried to ask Mia what was in it, but my words came out slurred, my tongue suddenly feeling thick and clumsy. The room started to tilt and spin, the edges of my vision blurring. I tried to stand up to shake off the sudden wave of dizziness, but my legs wouldn't cooperate. Panic started to rise in my chest as I realized something was very, very wrong. The last thing I remember is Mia's face swinging into view, her once sparkling eyes now cold and calculating. She said something, but her words made no sense, garbled and distant as if underwater. I tried to reach for her, to ask for help, but my arms felt like lead, my body no longer my own. And then Darkus. When I woke up the next morning, it was to a pounding headache and a sickening sense of disorientation. The sunlight streaming through the unfamiliar windows was too bright, too harsh. I squinted against the glare, trying to piece together where I was, how I'd gotten there. As I stumbled out of the strange bed, snippets of the night before started coming back to me. The bar, the endless conversation, the undeniable chemistry. Mia. But where was she now? And where were my things, my phone, my wallet, my keys? A frantic pat down of my pockets confirmed my worst fears. They were gone. Everything was gone. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. The drink, the sudden blackout, the missing possessions. Mia had drugged me. She had robbed me. The perfect date, the instant connection. It had all been a ruse, a twisted game to lure me in and take advantage. I felt sick, violated, utterly foolish. How could I have let this happen? How could I have been so blind, so trusting? The room spun around me as the magnitude of the situation sank in. I had to get out of there, had to find help, had to try to piece together the tatters of my shattered reality. The following hours were a blur of police reports, frantic phone calls to cancel credit cards, and a sickening sense of violation and self-doubt. How could I have let this happen? How could I have been so reckless with my safety? The shame and anger battled for dominance as I tried to piece together the fragments of that fateful night. It's been a year now since that night, and I'm still healing. There are still moments of fear, of doubt, of anger. But there are also moments of joy, of connection, of hope. I started dating again, but with a new perspective. I had been single for a while when I decided to give Tinder a shot. I was a bit skeptical at first, having heard my fair share of online dating horror stories, but I figured it was worth a try. After all, how else was I supposed to meet someone in this day and age? I spent some time crafting my profile, trying to strike a balance between showcasing my personality and not revealing too much. I uploaded a few flattering photos, wrote a witty bio, and started swiping. It wasn't long before I matched with Simon. He was incredibly handsome with a chiseled jaw and piercing blue eyes that seemed to sparkle even through the screen. His profile painted a picture of a successful, jet-setting businessman with a taste for the finer things in life. Our conversation took off immediately. Simon was charming, funny, and so easy to talk to. We bonded over our shared love of travel, trading stories of our favorite. 
destinations and bucket list spots. He had me hanging on his every word, eagerly awaiting his next message. As the days went by, our connection deepened. Simon started calling me pet names, showering me with compliments and declarations of affection. He told me he had never felt this way about anyone before, that he could see a real future with me. I was swept off my feet, caught up in a whirlwind romance that felt like something out of a fairy tale. Looking back, I can see all the warning signs I missed. The constant excuses for why we couldn't video chat or meet in person. The way he always seemed to be in the middle of some crisis or another from business deals gone sour to family emergencies. The vague, evasive answers he gave when I tried to pin down specifics about his life. But in the moment, I was too love-struck to see clearly. I was invested in the fantasy, in the idea of this perfect man who had chosen me, who wanted to build a life with me. So, when Simon first brought up his financial troubles, I didn't think twice about offering to help. He had become such a constant presence in my life, a source of comfort and excitement in a world that had started to feel dull and predictable. The idea of him being in any sort of distress was unbearable to me. He was hesitant at first, assuring me that he didn't want to burden me with his problems. But I insisted, telling him that I wanted to be there for him, to support him in any way I could. After all, isn't that what you do when you care about someone? He explained that a major business deal he had been working on for months had suddenly collapsed, leaving him in a precarious position. His assets, he said, were temporarily tied up, leaving him short on cash until he could get everything sorted out. He just needed a small loan to tide him over, a few thousand dollars that he would pay back with interest as soon as he had access to his funds again. It seemed like such a small thing, in the grand scheme of our budding relationship. I had already invested so much emotionally, What was a little financial investment to show my commitment and my trust in our future together? I didn't hesitate. I transferred the money that same day, dipping into my savings account without a second thought. The momentary pang of seeing my balance dip was quickly overshadowed by a rush of warmth at the thought of being there for Simon when he needed me. And for a few blissful days, it felt like I had made the right choice. Simon was more attentive than ever, his messages overflowing with gratitude and affection. He painted vivid pictures of the adventures we would have once his financial situation was resolved. Exotic beach getaways, lavish dinners in cities I had always dreamed of visiting, shopping sprees, and designer boutiques. He made me feel like I was living in a romance novel, like I had found my perfect match against all odds. But then, as suddenly as he had swept into my life, Simon went silent. At first, I wasn't too worried. He had mentioned that he would be busy sorting out the mess with his business deal, and I wanted to give him space to focus on getting everything back on track. I sent a few check-in texts just to let him know I was thinking of him, but received no response. I tried calling, but it went straight to voicemail. As the days ticked by with no word, a small seed of worry began to sprout in my mind. I told myself I was being paranoid, that he was just occupied with damage control and would reach out as soon as he could. But as one week pulled into two, That seed of worry grew into a gnawing anxiety that I couldn't shake. I scarred our message history, looking for any clues, any hint of what might be going on. But all I found were my own unanswered texts, my increasingly frantic attempts to reach him. His social media profiles, once a constant source of updates and interaction, sat dormant, frozen in time from the day of our last conversation. I reached out to a few mutual friends we had connected with through the app, but none of them had heard from him either. It was as if Simon had vanished into thin air, taking my money and my heart with him. As the reality of the situation slowly sank in, I felt like I was in a daze. The man I had poured my soul out to, the man I had envisioned building a life with, was gone. And with him, a chunk of my savings and a piece of my self-worth. I oscillated between anger and despair, between cursing my own self and clinging to the increasingly faint hope that there was some explanation that this was all just a misunderstanding and Simon would reappear with apologies and explanations. But as the weeks turned into months with no word, I had to face the brutal truth. I had been scammed. The person I had fallen for so hard and so fast was nothing more than a digital phantom, a carefully crafted persona designed to prey on my affections and exploit my trust. The betrayal cut deep, shaking the very foundations of my identity. How could I have been so blind, so reckless with my heart and my finances? What did it say about me that I had fallen for such an obvious trick? 
I spiraled into a dark place, my days blurring together in a haze of self-recrimination and grief. I shut up friends and family, too ashamed to admit what had happened, too raw to face the pity, and I told you so as I was sure would come. I reached out through every channel I could think of, but it was like Simon had vanished into thin air. His phone was disconnected, his social media profiles deleted, even his Tinder account had disappeared. It was as if the man I had fallen for never existed at all. The truth hit me like a freight train. I had been scammed. I was shattered both emotionally and financially. I had given so much of myself to this relationship, had pinned so many hopes and dreams on this imaginary future. And now I was left with nothing but a gaping hole in my bank account and a heart in pieces. I never expected to find myself in the middle of a missing person case, especially not one involving someone I had been dating. But that's exactly what happened a few months ago, and it's a story I'll never forget. It all started when I matched with Liam on Tinder. He was handsome, charming, and we hit it off right away. Our first date was a dream, drinks at a cozy bar, endless conversation, and a goodnight kiss that left me dizzy with excitement. From there, things progressed quickly. We saw each other multiple times a week, texting constantly in between. Liam was everything I had been looking for, attentive, adventurous, with a wicked sense of humor that kept me on my toes. We bonded over our shared love of hiking, trying new restaurants, and terrible reality TV. For the first time in a long time, I could see a real future with someone. But then, about a month into our relationship, something changed. Liam started taking longer to respond to my messages, canceling plans at the last minute with vague excuses. I tried not to read too much into it. We were both busy with work and life, and I didn't want to come across as clingy. One night, we had plans to meet up for dinner after he finished a big project at work. I got to the restaurant early, excited to see him after a few days apart. But as the minutes ticked by and my texts went unanswered, a knot of unease began to form in my stomach. I waited for over an hour, calling and texting with increasing frequency and frustration. But there was no response. No explanation, no apology, nothing. I went home that night confused and hurt, wondering what I had done wrong. The next day, I tried to give Liam some space, figuring he might reach out when he was ready to talk. But the silence stretched on, day after day, week after week. I oscillated between anger and worry, between drafting long, emotional texts, and resisting the urge to drive by his place to check on him. After about two weeks with no word, I started to fear the worst. This wasn't like Liam at all. Even if he had decided to ghost me, it was completely out of character for him to just disappear without a trace. I reached out to a few of his friends, but they hadn't heard from him either. A sinking feeling took root in my gut. Seeing Liam's face staring back at me from that news article was like a punch to the gut. It felt surreal like I had stumbled into a nightmare and couldn't wake up. My hands shook as I clutched my phone, reading and rereading the sparse details, trying to make them compute with the reality I thought I knew. Liam, my Liam, was missing. The man who had just weeks ago been filling my days with laughter and my nights with passion was now a headline, a statistic, a mystery. It didn't seem possible. As I scanned the article, one detail in particular lodged in my brain like a shard of glass. The last confirmed sighting of Liam was the night we were supposed to meet. For dinner. The night he had never shown up, never called, never responded to my increasingly frantic texts and calls. A wave of nausea washed over me as the implications sank in. I was likely the last person to have any contact with Liam before he vanished. The weight of that realization settled on my chest, making it hard to breathe. Questions swirled in my head, each more terrifying than the last. What had happened to Liam after our last conversation? Had he ever made it to the restaurant that night? Had something happened to him on the way there? Or had the trouble started even earlier, some danger or distress that I had been too self-absorbed to pick up on? I racked my brain, trying to remember every detail of our last interactions. Had there been any clues, any signs that something was amiss? I calmed through our texts, looking for hidden meanings, veiled cries for help. But there was nothing, just the usual flirty banter inside jokes and mundane check-ins about our days. The more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I needed to talk to the police. If I was indeed the last person to have spoken to Liam, I might have crucial information without even realizing it. Even the smallest detail could be the key of finding him, 
to bringing him home safe. My hands trembled as I dialed a non-emergency line, my heart pounding against my ribs. I stumbled through an explanation of who I was, my relationship to Liam, and the gnawing fear that had been growing in my gut for weeks. The operator listened patiently, assuring me that I had done the right thing by calling and that a detective would be in touch soon to take a full statement. The next few hours were a blur of anxiety and desperate hope. I paced my apartment, foam clutched tightly in my hand, jumping at every notification that wasn't from Liam. I alternated between praying that this was all just a misunderstanding, that Liam would walk through my door any minute with an explanation and an apology, and stealing myself for the grim possibility that something truly awful had happened. When the detective finally called, I was a nervous wreck, but I knew I had to hold it together to give them every scrap of information I could that might help find Liam. They asked me to walk through our relationship from the beginning, to describe Liam's habits, his routine, his state of mind in the days leading up to his disappearance. I told them everything I could think of, the places we frequented, the people we hung out with, any recent stressors or changes in Liam's life. I described our last conversations in painstaking detail, trying to recall any hint of trouble or unusual behavior. The next few weeks of police interviews, frantic searching, and sleepless nights imagining all the terrible things that could have happened to Liam. It's been six months now since Liam vanished. The official investigation has gone cold, but I still check for updates obsessively, still startle every time I see someone. Who looks like him on the street? I know the chances of a happy ending grow slimmer with each passing day, but I can't let go of the tiny ember of hope that somehow, somewhere, Liam is still out there. I've always been pretty cautious when it comes to online dating. I mean, you hear all these horror stories about catfishing and creeps, and it's enough to make anyone a little paranoid. But after a string of bad breakups and lonely Friday nights, I decided to give Tanner a shot. What's the worst that could happen, right? Famous last words. It started off innocently enough. I matched with this guy, let's call him Jake, who seemed cute and charming. A little intense, maybe, but in a way that I found kind of exciting. We chatted for a few days, the usual get-to-know-you stuff, jobs, hobbies, favorite movies. He had a dark sense of humor that bordered on twisted at times, but I chalked it up to an edgy personality. When he suggested meeting up for drinks, I figured why not. I was tired of staring at a screen, tired of the endless back and forth that never seemed to go anywhere. I wanted a real connection, a real spark. And Jake, with his brooding good looks and mysterious air, seemed like he might just fit the bill. The bar he picked was a dive, tucked away in a seedy part of town I'd never been to. I felt a flicker of unease as I pushed through the door, but I brushed it off. I was being paranoid, I, I told myself. Judgy. I needed to loosen up, live a little. Jake was already there when I arrived, lounging in a corner booth with a whiskey in hand. He looked just like his pictures. He greeted me with a hug that lingered just a beat too long, his hand skimming my lower back in a way that made me move. We fell into easy conversation, lubricated by the drinks that Jake kept ordering. He was funny, engaging with an intensity that was both unnerving and intoxicating. He had a way of leaning in when he spoke, his eyes more into mine like he could see straight through to my soul. As the night wore on and the drinks flowed, the conversation took a darker turn. Jake started making these offhand comments, these little jokes that weren't quite funny. Jokes about violence, uh, control, about the thrill of fear. I laughed them off at first, not wanting to seem uptight or easily shocked. But there was something in the way he said them, a glint in his eye that made my stomach twist. And then, out of nowhere, he leaned in close and whispered in my ear. He told me he had a secret, a deep, dark desire that he never shared with anyone before. His voice was low and urgent, his breath hot against my skin. He said he had a fetish for hurting people, for inflicting pain and terror. That it was all he could think about sometimes. The only thing that truly got him off. I felt like I'd been doused in ice water. I pulled back, my heart hammering in my chest, my mouth suddenly dry. I searched his face for any sign that he was joking that this was all some sick, twisted prank. But all I saw was hunger, a raw, animalistic need that made my blood run cold. I stammered out an excuse, something about an early morning meeting, and practically ran out of the bar. 
I could feel his eyes on me the whole way, burning into my back like lasers. I didn't look back, didn't stop moving until I was safe in my apartment with the doors locked and the blinds drawn. I blocked his number and deleted Tinder that same night, but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease, the creeping sense that I'd dodge a bullet but maybe not entirely. I kept seeing his face in crowds, in shadows, in the dark corners of my dreams. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't focus on anything but the sickening memory of his words, his eyes, his touch. I thought about going to the police, but what would I even say? That a guy I'd met on Tinder had a scary fetish? That he hadn't actually done anything to me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he wanted to. I felt silly, paranoid, like I was overreacting to what was probably just a bad joke or a clumsy attempt at dirty talk. But I also couldn't ignore my gut, that deep, primal instinct that told me something was very wrong. I started taking self-defense classes, started carrying pepper spray in my purse. I stopped going out alone at night, stopped trusting my own judgment when it came to men and dating. It's been a year now, and I'm still not the same. I'm jumpy, anxious, played by a constant low-grade fear that I can't seem to shake. I find myself wondering about Jake, uh, what he's doing and who he's with. I wonder if he's found someone else to share his dark desires with, someone who didn't run away like I did. I know logically that I did the right thing, that no matter how charming or attractive someone seems, a red flag is a red flag. That my safety, my sanity, is worth more than any fleeting connection or thrill. I've always been a hopeless romantic. I love the idea of meeting someone special, of feeling that instant spark and connection. So when online dating became a thing, I was all over it. Tender, Bumble, Hinge, I tried them all, swiping and chatting and going on countless first dates, always hoping that the next one would be the one. But for every cute coffee date or fun bar hookup, there were also the not-so-great experiences. The guys who looked nothing like their photos, the ones who couldn't stop talking about their exes, the ones who got way too handsy way too fast. I learned to take the good with the bad to keep my expectations in check and my guard up. Or so I thought. It was supposed to be just another Tinder date. The guy, let's call him Mike, seemed nice enough. Attractive photos, funny bio, decent conversation. We had been. Chatting for a few days, and he seemed eager to meet up. I suggested grabbing drinks at a popular bar downtown, somewhere public and well-lit. The date started off fine. Mike was charming and attentive, asking me questions about my job and my hobbies. But as the night went on and the drinks kept coming, something shifted. He started getting touchy-feely, his hand constantly finding its way to my thigh or the small of my back. I kept subtly moving away, trying to create some distance, but he would just scoot closer undeterred. I started to feel uneasy. Mike's demeanor had changed from friendly to aggressive, his eyes taking on a predatory glint. He started making crude jokes, hinting not so subtly at what he wanted to do to me later. I laughed it off awkwardly, trying to change the subject, but inside I was starting to panic. When I finally made an excuse to leave, insisting I had an early morning the next day, Mike offered to walk me home. I declined, saying I would just grab a Uber, but he was insistent. I want to make sure you get home safe, he said, but the way he said it made my skin crawl. Against my better judgment, I let him walk with me. I figured it was just a few blocks, and that I could say goodbye at my door and be done with this increasingly uncomfortable night. But as we walked, Mike kept trying to pull me into alleyways and to dark corners. Let's take a shortcut, he kept saying, his grip on my arm tightening. I kept pulling away, insisting on staying on the well-lit streets, my heart hammering in my chest. When we finally got to my building, I was relieved. I thanked Mike quickly and turned to go inside, eager to put this whole night behind me. But as I fumbled with my keys, I felt him press up behind me, his body pinning me against the door. What are you doing? I asked my voice, shaky with fear. But he just chuckled, his breath hot and sour against my neck. Come on. Don't be like that, he slurred, his hands starting to roam across my body. We both know why we're here. Panic rising in my throat, I tried to push him away, but he was so much bigger than me. He grabbed my wrists, slamming me back against the door, his knee forcing its way between my legs. I could feel him hardening against my hip, could smell the alcohol on his breath. Stop. I pleaded, tears springing to my eyes. Please, I don't want this. But he wasn't listening. One hand held my wrists in a bruising grip above my head, 
while the other fumbled with the button in my jeans. I squirmed and thrashed, but I couldn't break free. I was trapped, helpless, bracing myself for the inevitable. And then, in a sudden burst of adrenaline, I remembered the self-defense class I had taken years ago. Without thinking, I brought my knee up hard between his legs, at the same time twisting my arms free and shoving him with all my might. Mike doubled over, groaning, his grip loosening just enough for me to wrench the door open and stumble inside. I slammed it shut behind me, locking it with shaking hands, my whole body trembling with shock and residual fear. For a long moment I just stood there, trying to catch my breath, trying to process what had just happened. And then the reality hit me and I crumpled to the floor, sobbing. I don't know how long I stayed there, huddled against the door. Minutes, hours. Time seemed to lose all meaning. Eventually, I picked myself up, took a long, hot shower, trying to scrub away the feeling of his hands, his body against mine. The next day, I reported him to Tinder. I considered going to the police. The thought of reliving that night, of being questioned and doubted and blamed, was too much to bear. I knew the statistics, knew how rarely these things resulted in any real consequences for the perpetrator. Instead, I focused on healing. I went to therapy, joined a support group for survivors. I learned that what happened to me wasn't my fault, that no matter what I wore or drank or said, I didn't deserve to be assaulted. It's been two years now, and I won't say I'm completely over it. I still have moments of panic, still starvel at unexpected touches. Dating is hard, trusting it's harder, but I'm working on it day by day. When I first joined Tinder, I was looking for a fun distraction, maybe a casual date or two. I never expected it to turn into my worst nightmare. His name was Alex, and at first, he seemed perfect. Handsome, charming, with a profile full of adventurous travel photos and witty one-liners. We matched quickly and fell into an easy banter, bonding over our shared love of terrible puns and late-night food deliveries. In the beginning, it was like something out of a fairy tale. Alex showered me with attention and affection, always ready with a sweet compliment or a funny story to brighten my day. He seemed to genuinely care about my thoughts and feelings, remembering little details I had shared and checking in on me when I was stressed or upset. We texted constantly, sharing memes and playlists and inside jokes. Our phone calls became a nightly ritual, sometimes stretching for hours as we talked about everything and nothing. I opened up to him in a way I hadn't with anyone else, sharing my hopes and fears and secret dreams for the future. When Alex suggested we meet up in person, I didn't hesitate. Our first date was magic, wandering through a quirky museum, sipping coffee in a cozy bookstore, talking and laughing until the sun went down. I remember thinking that I could get used to this, to the easy intimacy and companionship. For the first time in a long time, I let myself imagine a future with someone by my side. But as the weeks went on, the fairy tale started to develop cracks. It was subtle at first, a slightly pushy text, an offhand comment that felt a little too possessive. Alex started wanting to know every move, texting incessantly if I was out with friends or didn't respond right away. If I tried to carve out some alone time or set a boundary, he pout and guilt trip me, saying how much he missed me, how I must not really care about him. He'd send long, anguished messages about how it was the only thing keeping him going, the only light in his dark world. The implication was always clear. I was responsible for his happiness, his well-being. If I couldn't give him what he needed, I was failing him. I tried to be understanding, to be the supportive girlfriend he seemed to crave. I made excuses for his behavior, told myself he was just going through a tough time, that he needed extra reassurance and attention. I spent hours talking him down from emotional ledges, canceling plans and losing sleep to prove my devotion. But no matter how much I gave, it was never enough. The demands escalated. The guilt tripping intensified. If I dared to assert my need for space, Alex would spiral into a meltdown, flooding my phone with frantic accusations and dark threats. He'd talk about how worthless and alone he felt, how he didn't know if he could go on without me. More than once, in the middle of the night, he sent me pictures of self-harm, ominous messages about not wanting to wake up tomorrow. I'd spend hours trying to calm him down, to convince him to stay safe, all while feeling like the worst person in the world for making him feel this way. It was a grinding cycle of emotional highs and lows, of walking on eggshells and second-guessing my every move. I became a shell of myself, 
constantly anxious and drained, jumping to attention every time my phone buzzed. My friends expressed concern, but I waved them off too deep in the fog of manipulation to see clearly. Even when I did try to set firmer boundaries to insist on some semblance of independence, I was met with a tidal wave of rage and despair. Alex would barrage me with texts and voicemails, alternating between pleading and threatening. He'd say I was abandoning him, that I was selfish and cruel, that he couldn't live without me. Overwhelmed and exhausted, I finally told Alex that I couldn't do this anymore. That his behavior was making me uncomfortable and I needed to end things. I thought that would be the end of it. A clean break, a lesson learned about red flags and unhealthy attachments. I couldn't have been more wrong. The email started coming a few days later, long, rambling messages filled with alternating pleas and threats. Alex begged me to take him back, promising to change, to be better. When that didn't work, his tone turned dark, menacing. He started referencing things about me that I had never told him. The name of my childhood pet, my parents' address, the elementary school I had attended. He sent photos of me that I had never shared and had shots taken from across the street or through my apartment window. I was terrified. How have you gotten this information? Had you been stalking me this whole time, gathering ammunition to use against me? The thought of him watching me, violating my privacy so thoroughly, made my skin crawl. And then came the blackmail. In excruciating detail, Alex laid out all the ways he planned to ruin my life if I didn't do what he wanted. He would send intimate photos of me to my boss, my colleagues, my family. He would post my personal information on shady forums, inviting harassers and trolls to make my life hell. He had access to all my accounts, and he wasn't afraid to use it. I felt trapped, suffocated. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. Every time my phone buzzed, I felt a wave of nausea, dreading what fresh horror Alex had in store for me. I was too ashamed to tell anyone, convinced that they would blame me for not being more careful, for letting a stranger get so close. For weeks, I lived in a state of constant fear and anxiety. I did whatever Alex asked, answered his every message and call, all in the desperate hope that it would be enough to keep him at bay. But nothing was ever enough. The demands kept coming, each one more invasive and degrading than the last. Finally, in a moment of sheer desperation, I reached out to a domestic violence hotline. Sobbing, I poured out my story to the counselor on the other end of the line bracing myself for judgment or disbelief. But instead, I was met with compassion, with validation. For the first time, someone told me that what was happening to me wasn't my fault, that I didn't deserve this abuse. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.